Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the calendar has flipped over to 2023, and the Calgary Flames are back in a playoff spot. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, and uh, I hope everybody around uh, the Sea of Red had a good holiday season, and uh, just looking forward to getting back to some nice Flames talk and, you know, back into the swing of things it was a good holiday season for flames fans a lot of fun flames hockey to watch we're not going to break down all six games but let's look at this in two chunks let's look at the pre-christmas road trip which was the two san jose games la and the ducks and then we'll look at the after christmas games so weird this is the first time we're seeing it we saw it last month and we see it again this month where the flames kind of play the same team twice in a row, but not back-to-back. They played the San Jose Sharks in the 18th and then the 20th, both in San Jose. Big Flames wins here. On the 18th, the Flames won 5-2, and on the 20th, 7-3. Matt, what was your thoughts on those two games? Well, on our last episode, uh, the thing I was mostly critical about was getting uh, more scoring chances in front of the net. And... San Jose is really exceptionally bad defensively where basically every Flames player could just walk right in front of the goalie and score. And 12 goals in two games, it was fun. Um, the The team just exploited every weakness that San Jose had and like they're, the Sharks are a tire fire defensively. And um like they might be the single worst team defensively in the nhl and calgary after those credit, two games a, yeah they definitely look like it yeah like they it took full advantage of it and you know the sharks had no answer like anytime you're scoring 12 goals in two games on the same team like it, yeah it, there's no excuse it's not like the goalies were bad in either game it's just yeah. <laughs> that well, and in that second scored. game, I'm just checking this score sheet here. The Flames scored twice in thirty in the first thirty seconds. Yeah, which was the uh, franchise record as well. And it's like, cool, you guys are, you know, like especially after getting thumped in the first game, you'd think that the Sharks would be champing at the bit to, you know, bounce back. And then literally thirty seconds in, they're already down two nothing, which it's basically game over already. At that point, and it's like, cool. The um, biggest surprise to me in game two is that they left Reimer in for the entire game. Well, after what we did to the other goalie in the first game, it, you know, it's only fair that, well, he got paced. You, you each get a chance day. to get embarrassed? Yeah, so it's your turn. Have fun. <laughs> like, I can kind of see 5 2, okay, keep, you know, don't switch the guy out, but 7 3, like, after. I don't know. To me, four goals is kind of that metric where you look at pulling your goalie. Yeah. Well, and to be fair, none of the goals were really James Reimer's fault. It, same as the other game. Like the it, both goalies played adequately. It's just when you're letting everybody like right in front of the net, left, right, and center uh, for tap-ins. Like, come on. Uh, you know, like the goalies are human beings. You know, they're not robots, so, like, there's only so fast they can react to shots when it's literally from point-blank range. And This is probably the best we've seen of the Flames sort of getting in front of the net and putting net pressure on. And and I don't think the Flames can be, like you said earlier, credited for doing that really well. I think it's partly, yeah, they did well, but also San Jose's looked terrible. Yeah, like the Sharks... To their credit, like they they are very good offensively, the San Jose Sharks. And if you're not uh, being assertive enough, they can creep up on you. Um, but Calgary was being assertive enough and got four points, which exactly what they needed. And then uh, the Calgary Flames finished off their pre-Christmas road trip on the 22nd and 23rd with two back-to-back games. On the 22nd, they lost to L.A. 4-3 in overtime. And on the 23rd, uh, Calgary beat Anaheim 3-2 in overtime. Yeah, this uh, first game against L.A., uh, I thought that they were not as um, tight defensively. Uh, or offensively, I mean, in terms of like getting chances in front of the goalie. And were more like their normal perimeter 
uh, game. Uh, but to their credit, they were able to force it at least to overtime after falling down 3-1 to one early in the third period. They battled back on goals by Toffoli and Dubé. Um, and the overtime was just really, really bad <laughs> for the Flames. Uh, like, Huberdeau had a couple of chances that he did not do well on, and Adrian Kempe finished it. And you know, there's only credit, so much. There's yeah. only so much kind of um, gas in the yeah. I guess gas in the tank. And when you're down, you know, three to one, you come back, tie it up. Like it kind of feels like the Flames used their gas to do that, and then ran out in overtime. Yeah, because they were kind of flat. Like even though the Flames had possession for the majority of overtime, uh, they just couldn't seem to get any cohesive attacks in on the goaltender and. Uh, yeah, the game slipped away from them, but just getting the game two overtime is a big deal because of the fact that the Kings are one of two teams that are ahead of the Flames in the division currently, so at least minimizing the damage. Like, obviously it would have been better to collect the two points and them yep. only getting one. But the OT but let us get at least a point on every game this trip. Yeah, and getting those points when you don't necessarily deserve it uh, or you fight back, um, those add up, especially at the end of the season. And, you know, can be the difference between winning the division and playing a weak wildcard team or uh, having to face a really tough team in the first round. And, you know, it makes a big difference. And, you know, it was good for the Flames to bow back to at least get the point. I totally agree. And then uh, the Flames went on their Christmas break for three days after that one, coming home from the road trip. They had the 24th, 25th, 26th off. And then, of course, the big game. I was in Mexico over Christmas, and I there was a sports bar in my resort, and I made sure that I was able to watch this game on the 27th there in its entirety. The ba- the last of the Battle of Alberta, which unfortunately the Flames fell 2-1. to one. What are your um, thoughts on that game? You skipped the Ducks game. Uh, just, oh, uh, S- sorry. I was kind of looking at the L.A. and the Ducks game as, as kind of one. Uh, I think a lot of the yeah, same the story Ducks there, game, the overtime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the Ducks game, it was mostly uh, just allowing inopportune power play goals. Um, but the Flames basically dominated that one throughout. And, yeah, uh, not really much to say. And that was just a good play by Nikita Zadorov in the overtime to – Create space for Anderson to get, to get a goal. Yeah, to get it over to Anderson. Did you feel in this one that the Flames were... It, it, in the Ducks game, it seemed to me like the Flames were a little bit sluggish. So were the Ducks. It seemed like both teams were kind of done for the holiday season. Yeah, and Calgary just is a significantly better team. And so like they were just able to fire shot after shot after shot on net. Uh, they ended up with 45 of them on... Uh, Dostal, but um, yeah, it, it was one of those where I thought Dostal had a really good game, um, especially because like the Wranglers uh, beat him earlier in the year, uh, and I think they scored like six or seven against him uh, in the game that the Wranglers played. So, you know, for him to step up into the NHL and face forty-five shots, I thought he acquitted himself well. But welcome to the show, yeah. kid. Yeah, the Ducks are terrible. Um, like, really, it, it's um, Zegras, Terry, McTavish, and that's about it. <laughs> yeah, they're. I think they're, like, second from the bottom in the whole league right now. Yeah, th- this is a team where it's going to be, like, five or six years. Like, even if yeah. they do get Bedard, like, it, it's still going to be five or six years. Like, they're bad, objectively. So, Battle of Alberta, what did you think of this one, Matt? Uh, I thought Calgary was the significantly better team um, throughout the contest. And just the bad penalty by Manjapane um, holding on to Darnell Nurse allowed the Edmonton Oilers with their vaunted power play to get the win. Um, I just thought that they didn't have enough fight back after the Oilers took the lead, but you know, they did outshoot them 24-4 to four, uh, in the third. Um, not much more you can say about that. Like, they did try, 
but like they just weren't able to convert. And I don't think that they got too many high quality scoring chances in that third period. No, they, I mean the Flames shot forty seven goal, forty seven shots on goal in this one. But I didn't think even outside the third, and then there was a ton of really great chances in those. No, and the, you can tell when they're falling into bad habits of uh, just shooting the puck from anywhere. And, like, yeah, you're padding your stats of, like, oh, well, we got 47 shots. That's awesome. But, um, you know, if they're from, like, the face-off dot and up, like, any quality NHL goalie is going to stop those. And But at the same time, you can't score if you don't put them on net. No, and it, it's one of those that, like, the Flames need to find a way to make adjustments. Like, it, getting those kind of shots are fine. Um, like last year they did get a lot of shots like that, but you had guys like Kachuk standing in front of the net to tip the pucks and, you know, like get rebounds and, you know, create havoc from there. And like the flames are not really screening the goaltenders that much and are not having somebody to tip in front of the net or, you know, pounce on rebounds or any of like the secondary, you know, like they're doing great with the first half of that but they're not at all with the second half and they need that if they're wanting to be successful. The next night, the flames took a quick trip over to Seattle. I don't think there's much to say about this one. Flames won three, two against the Kraken. And that was kind of the expected result. Yeah. Seattle's kind of slowing down now. Um, they had a hot start and they did. Yeah, I'm honestly surprised the, by their start. Yeah. They ended up taking the lead at one point and, Calgary battled back, tied the game, and then were just kind of all over the Kraken in the third, eventually getting the game winner. Again, 44 shots. Uh, they they still need to get more scoring chances despite the high shots, but they did enough, and that's all you need. Like you know, especially with the Flames' upcoming schedule for the remainder of the season. Um, it's a heavily weighted mediocre team fest for the rest of the year, uh, where like the good teams that we'll be facing mostly are like teams like Seattle who are like eighth to 10th and with very few upper teams remaining. Uh, so Calgary just needs to be able to find a way to grind out those type of games, um, if they, they're not able to acquire another score or two at some point, which that we can talk about that later. Uh, but, you know, it, it's good to see them learning how to win games like this um, and be able to shut the other team down effectively when their games are tight like this. Yeah, no, I agree. And uh, this was maybe tighter than I would have liked it to be against the Kraken. Um, yeah, But I think sure. the fact the Flames were able to sort of battle back in this one and take the lead and show that, you know what, you can't always win, you know, by big scores like you do against San Jose, you know, 7-2, 5-3, that sort of thing. But the fact they're able to sort of battle back and get that W, as Daryl said, he doesn't care how you get the W, just get the W. I think it's really and, – and even the way the Flames played in this one, I think that we were we were seeing the Calgary Flames game progressing in this one. I'd say all yeah. these games after Christmas especially – yeah, and like you're starting to see guys, all the new guys like Huberdeau, Uyghur, Kadri, um, they're starting to get it and are both doing well defensively while translating their offensive game more. Um, and it, it's one of those where Calgary needs to start having contributions from their depth guys and their new a higher scoring forwards if they're wanting to say have a chance at winning the division and like currently there's not far enough away where it's an impossibility but you you got to have everybody on the same page and we're starting to see that more recently the last game that we'll cover here and we won't spend a ton of time on it was uh, the Calgary Flames playing the Vancouver Canucks on New Year's Eve the big note here is Mackenzie Weger gets his first goal as a flame. It was the third of the game. Calgary got up 3-0 here, let it slip a little bit as Vancouver got two goals. Honestly, neither one, uh, I would say Markstrom's fault. Maybe maybe the one where he went out to challenge a little bit. 
uh, even then, you know, like he made the first stops. It, it was you. You could good. argue maybe shouldn't have gone out that far, but I think that there should have also been a little bit more clearance in front of the net. Yeah, that I I, I always feel that like if the goalie makes like the first and second save, that realistically he's done his job, and like the defenders need to stop more shots from coming, and. Yeah, the Flames just didn't do that. Both of them were really unfortunate, bizarre plays. Like, having a puck chipped up in the air and swatted out of the air into the top corner of the net. And, you know, Hannafin misplaying the puck in the corner and then that whole scrambly play. You know, like, those don't typically happen. And it's kind of like fluky good goals for Vancouver, which, good for them, but, like, Calgary really... I thought closed the door effectively and didn't really allow a ton uh, for the Canucks the rest of the way. And I also have to say that uh, JT Miller is really bad, and I am very glad that he's not a Calgary Flame because that contract is looking ugly and uglier by the day. Like, yeah, I don't watch so... a lot of Canucks hockey, but in that game especially, I was really scratching my head at Miller. Yeah, like you... It, well, we've all heard people complaining about Lucic, but at least Lucic is, you know, generally slotted as a third, fourth line guy. And, you know, he hits, at least. Um, whatever Miller was doing in that game, you know, like, uh, if there was a young guy, you'd be saying, well, this guy clearly needs to go back to the AHL because uh, he doesn't, you know, seem to have the effort levels... <laughs> required to be an nhl player and yet he's making and like and maybe that's just not wanting to be in vancouver yeah like uh, good on him for getting that long-term high dollar contract but boy that's not looking good for vancouver especially if they have to lose bo horvat who's really emerged for them this year as like one of the top scorers in the nhl it's yeah like just really unfortunate for them if they have to lose horvat because of Miller. I agree. Um, so Matt, looking at where we're at now with the Calgary Flames, they have played 38 games. So they'll be officially at their halfway point after this week. They now have 18 wins, 13 losses, seven overtime losses for a total of 43 points, which puts them third in the Pacific division, LA and Vegas ahead of them. LA is at 48 and uh, Vegas at 52 points in the Pacific. The wild card is Seattle at 42, Edmonton at 42, Colorado at 41. So we generally don't do a lot of talking about the other teams in our division, but let's call it halfway through the season. Are you surprised at how the Pacific division and maybe those two wild card spots are shaping up right now? Well, frankly, I did not expect the Oilers to be very good this year. Um, I, they kind of caught uh, lightning in a bottle uh, last year when uh, they had uh, Evander Kane come in through halfway through the year and just be like an automatic goal a game guy, pretty much. Um, but it, you know, you had to expect some step back from that. Seattle being better than I thought they were going to be is a bit of a shock. But LA and you Vegas are basically where. You know, they should have been last year and where they are now. Are you shocked that the defending Stanley Cup champion Colorado Avalanche are out of the wildcard picture right now? Uh, a little bit. Um, you know, it, it's one of those where uh, they're having to readjust for basically losing their entire second line from last year, and that takes a bit of time to readjust. I didn't think they were going to be as good this year because... Losing Burakovsky and Kadri, uh, like that's a huge gutting of the team. Um, like it, the, no team can suffer losing a good ninety-point second-line center for nothing. And Burakovsky did quite a good job in his own right. And you know, like it, it's hard to keep, continue steamrolling um, teams when that kind of thing happens. And by the way, when you mentioned uh, the Flames' record of 18, 13, and 7, um, a year ago, uh, the Flames' record after 38 games was 20, 12, and 6. 
Um, so realistically, the Flames were only like three points back of their pace from a season ago at the same point in the year. And I think that's a really good thing to mention, too. I mean, we've slagged on the team. We've heard, you know, the Sea of Red slagging on the team that this team hasn't looked as good early in the season. But like you said, I mean, they're not doing that different than they were last year, which I think arguably was one of the best years for this team in a while. Yeah, and you have to look at the games that they played in the first 38 last year, and it was a hodgepodge of some good teams, some bad teams, some in the middle. And this year, it's been pretty much up until the recently with the California trip, it's been pretty much elite team after elite team after elite team. And like the Flames have had the hardest schedule in the NHL to this point where they were kind of middle of the road at this point last year. So, you know, to frankly be only three points back of their pace from a season ago is actually quite impressive. And it bodes well now that guys like Huberdeau and Kadri, Uyghur, and everybody else seems to be on that right page. You know, like it, and Markstrom seems to be playing more like himself from a season ago. Like, if all of those factors start coming together, like, this team, because of the fact that they also have the easiest schedule in the league for the rest of the year, they could go on a protracted run of winning a lot of games, frankly. So Matt, I guess that brings me to we'll we'll do our uh we'll do our actual sort of uh mid season prediction episode last week. We're gonna do it this week, but we'll do it after forty one games. We'll do that next week. Um but I guess the question now, if you look at where the team is after thirty eight games, sort of the first if we call it the twenty twenty two section of the of the season are they where you expect them to be are they lower or higher in the standings about where you expected uh i was figuring that they'd be uh, around 45 to 48 points um at about this point just because of the quality of competition 43 is close enough um it, it's hard uh just because of the fact that like they were struggling to adapt all these new people into the team the goaltending was bad and the quality of competition. Like it was just like a perfect storm of everything not being ideal, but it's like in my mind, like as long as the flames survived to the end of the calendar year, uh, then it's like, okay, now it's time to have fun. And you know, like the flames are in a playoff spot and you know, they're not far off of, you know, like if they win the two games in hand that they have on the LA Kings, they're one point behind them and they're nine points back of Vegas, which that's also fairly easy to make up over a half of a season. So, and Vegas has had a relatively easy schedule, uh, thus far. So, and like, they're going to be going through the tough part of their schedule coming up. So it's going to be a lot more tough for them to maintain their excellent play thus far as well. You know, I think what you're just talking about, about the games in hand on L.A. is a, I don't want to say a big factor here, but we are. We're, you know, two games down from where L.A. is. They played 40 games. We played 38. Seattle's at 35. So I think here, you know, by the time we sort of even out all these games, I think the Pacific Division stats especially could change quite a bit here. And I I expected the Flames to maybe be higher than they are right now in the standings, but as you've mentioned on this show and you've mentioned on previous episodes, they had a hard schedule in the first half. And I think with all that in mind, being higher than a wild card spot, I'm happy with where they're at. Yeah, and, you know, silver linings that, they are not in a wild card spot, you know, like it, it, if they were out of the playoffs right now, I would not be entirely surprised just off of their schedule. As long as they were showing some life at this point, uh, like where you now are starting to see like the lines actually coming together and, you know, uh, the team gelling in a proper way, uh, which we didn't see for the, well, pretty much until the end of November. Well, and, and even on that, like we saw so many of the lines sort of changing in the first, I'd even say the first 20 games. And it seems like the Flames have really found 
the lines that are working for them now. And one guy I really wanted to point out here is Dylan Dubé. And you and I have talked Dylan Dubé for a number of seasons, especially this season, about is yeah. what is Dylan Dubé, where does he fit? And do I think Dylan Dubé is a first-line left winger? No. Neither did I think that uh, Adam Rajishka was a first-line left winger when he was up there. But, Matt, I don't know what you think. I think that for the players we have on the roster right now, the best place for Dylan Dubé is with Lindholm and Defoley. Yeah, and like I know earlier in the year, like you were thinking like he's more of a third, fourth line kind of guy. Where I I was like, well, based off of the end of last year, I you know there was enough flash there that there might be something there, and um, he's looked really good on that line with Lindholm and uh, Toffoli and. You know, if that can continue and he can produce, you know, like he's on pace for pretty much match his season from a year ago. Um, you know, he has uh, eight goals and 21 points. Uh, last year he had 18 goals and 32 points. He should easily beat his point total from last year, but should be matching his goal total. Um, you know, like it, that he's starting to cement himself as a possible reliable top six forward in the NHL and you know it, it depends on like what version of Dubé you're getting if you're getting the passive uh not physically engaged version uh that lends more to the third fourth liner type guy <laughs> uh but when he's actually engaged in you know fighting for pucks in the corner and you know being a bit of a disturber himself uh you're starting to see more from him yeah, for sure. And, you know, I I think that just because of his inconsistencies, I don't think you can maybe look at him still as that top six guy. You never know which version you're going to get that night. Oh, you no, can't kind for of sure. start him up there and then, you know, demote him. So I think until he can be consistent, you can't look at him that way. But I found that with Lindholm and Toffoli, I mean, Lindholm is very much a two way center. Toffoli, I think, is being looked at as being the scorer on that line. I think those two guys have really helped to hide some of Dubé's weaknesses. Oh, for sure. And you see that like whenever insert miscellaneous guy gets put with Michael Backlund. Um, that between like Lindholm and Backlund, like they are two of the elite defensive players in the NHL. And they're so good defensively that they're able to hide a lot of warts, which is perfect for guys like Dubé or Rajitska or Manjapane uh, when he's been on that line um, to allow them the space to learn how to be on that line effectively. And like we saw when Kachuk first came into the NHL and was with Backlund and Froelich, um, that, you know, it took a while for Kachuk to learn the defensive side of things. Like the offense was always there, but the defense was not. And he eventually figured out how to play like that and had such a good year last year. And, you know, like having guys like uh, Rujitska, like Manjapane, and like Dubé on lines with really good defensive players. And thankfully, Kadri also is an exceptionally good defensive forward. So you, you kind of have really good teachers up the middle uh, for the young players to use as a foil to improve their game. Speaking of Kadri, this we'll, we'll call it the second line, but Huberto, Kadri have been put together. And we saw them play with Manjapani for part of the season there, but it looks like their new line mate, and I don't know how long this will last, is Milan Lucic. And I think that really shows our weakness at wing there. I mean, Lucic was scratched for a while because he wasn't looking good. We had you know some discussion a few weeks ago, but maybe Lucic's time as an NHL is done. What do you think of Lucic playing on that line? Uh, he's been the perfect option for what's been available at the moment. Um, it, you know, it's hard to say anything other than he's played damn good for the team since he's been on the second line. Like he's done everything that you could ever possibly hope from Lucic on that pairing. Is that enough for this team moving forward? No. And, uh, you know, uh, the Flames need another scorer on the team, period, at, at this point. And um, that will be, uh, 
like a main thing that they will need to do in the next few weeks uh, upcoming is to find a guy who's a reliable goal scorer, uh, whether it's a former teammate of uh, Huberdo in like a guy like Anthony Duclair or, you know, insert miscellaneous high scoring forward from bad team <laughs> here. And, uh, you know, it, it, they do need another scorer for that line. Uh, but you know, the, the three seem to be working relatively well, uh, since they've been put together and that's the important thing for now. You're a big fan of Andrew Mangiapane as a, as a flame. What do you think of the fact that he's now on the third line of Backlund and Coleman? Um, frankly, I think it's also a good thing for Mangiapane. Uh, uh, he, he at times seems to be trying too hard. Um, and not letting things just flow. And I think it, it, he's not really used to facing the kind of adversity he has this year because he's been getting high quality shots uh, frequently enough where like his goal total should probably be around 12, 13, 14, 15 instead of seven. And he's getting into the right places to take those shots. And yet for whatever reason, they just aren't going in for him and allowing him to kind of focus on his game by having him with Coleman and Backland. Like he doesn't need to worry about, uh, needing to be the guy offensively. He can just focus on his game and kind of get, into a good rhythm again. And uh, I, and I think, really like that line in the Vancouver game. Yeah. And you know, it's not like uh, Coleman and Backlund are bad at scoring. Um, like Coleman scored 20 goals previously. Backlund's been a 45, 50 point player for most of his career. You know, like um, both those guys are very effective at setting up plays. And so like Manjapane could be a decent fit on that line for, a while and even into the playoffs, if the flames do manage to get that good quality second line score to go with Huberdo and Kadri, like you could have three really good, well-balanced lines if they go that route. And I think, I think though, if, if Manjapani can't solve things by the playoffs, it's worrisome. Oh, for sure. And, and how would you say, I'm expecting him to have a big second half. And I, I feel that by him getting pushed down in the lineup, he can kind of just focus on the things that he needs to. And I think the scoring will start to come. And I think like once he starts getting a couple of bounces going his way, that he could go on a tear like he did last year where he scores like 15 goals in 20 games. It, it's just... Um, he's not having that kind of luck at this point and it's one of those where he just needs to put his nose down and just focus on you know doing all the little things the offense like he's still as good of a player as he was he's still generating a lot of high danger chances just for whatever reason, the the puck's just not going in for him. Like, even uh, the game against Vancouver, yeah, wide open net, hits the post. It's like, that right there has been his season. Where, <laughs> you know, it, it should have went in, but, you know, nope. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, I, and just watching those guys, I like them playing together. I think it's a good lineup of Mon Japani, Backlund, Coleman, but I also look at that lineup and think to myself, A, it's a really expensive third line. And I think that, you know, we expect more from Coleman. We expect more from Monjapani, or at least I do with the contracts they have in their past. And it just seems like that might almost be the the island of misfit, misfit toys in some way. It's like that's the, the guys who, you know, we need to sort of rehab their, their seasons and yeah. backland. Yeah, well, to me, it reminds me of quite a lot of uh, Tampa Bay's third line when they were winning the Cup uh, or, like, going to the Eastern Conference Finals repeatedly uh, because all three of those guys are able to chip in and score, yet are all really good defensively. And, like, when you get to the playoffs, having a third line like that is pivotal 
Um, uh, and you know, everybody's got to have his role on the team. And like Manjapane last year was really effective on the second line for whatever reason, things just have not clicked for him. Uh, even though like he naturally should be a good fit with Kadri and Huberto, but for whatever reason, it's just not working at the moment. Um, whether that gets revisited at some point or not, we'll see. Uh, I would not be surprised uh, when uh, Lucic's play s- starts to falter a bit that you w- wouldn't see Manjapane move up into uh, his spot and uh, you know see uh, him with those two guys. And, and I think I'd know. feel better about Manjapane there if Lucic wasn't our second line right winger. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, uh, Huber Doe is good enough where you can put him either on the right wing or the left wing. Um, so, like, having Munjapane play on the second line left wing, uh, I think, is perfectly doable. Uh, it's just, I think, how would you say, you want to reward Lucic for his excellent play and kind of ride that bus while it's going. Um because that, that just gives you a little bit more time to allow Manjapane to get more confidence in his own game before switching them up. And I think that yep. like what you'll see is Ruzitska move up to the line with Coleman and uh, Backlund at that point, and Lucic drop down to the fourth line again. But you kind of have to just let Lucic burn out his heater that he's on and then reevaluate. Bring out then. the last of the NHL talent. Well, no, I, I, how would you say, I think Lucic could still play another year or two or three in the NHL, uh, not necessarily with us, but you know, like he's I think a if he comes serviceable back, NHL player, I think that, if he comes so. back, he'd be your 13. Yeah. And I would expect that there would be a lot of other teams needing leadership yeah. that would want him. Uh, to play more, I think in that case, role. he almost becomes your Trevor Lewis, you know, your sort of old hand who you bring in just for the leadership. Yeah, exactly. So we'll, we'll see what happens in the lineup, but it's working. So don't make changes to it. Um, but you know that we, okay, let's go here before I jump off to the next topic. I was going to ask you, we've been talking since the beginning of the season about some of the weaknesses in the flames lineup. And I think we're all, pretty sure they're going to be making a hockey trade for a top six forward at some point. Last year, they acquired Toffoli. I believe it was actually on Valentine's Day. It was in mid-February. They did that deal way before the trade deadline. Matt, when do you think we're going to expect to see that hockey trade from the Flames? Do you think it'll be before the All-Star game, after the All-Star game? What kind of timeline are you looking at there? Uh, I think it'll be sooner than the uh, the trade deadline by a fair margin i would expect true living to get his homework done early like he did last year um i i think that a lot of teams that are kind of in the bubble of we might currently be sucking but we're not too bad that we're out of it uh are gonna want to keep on to their guys and like the teams that are like way out of it, like the Anaheim's and the San Jose's and the Chicago's, they don't really have a ton of talent in the first place. Um, you know, like Arizona, like who are you gonna pilfer from their team that's not like a young core piece? There isn't anybody because they're no. bad. You know, um, Chicago, like unless you get Kane or Taves, there's nothing else in that organization Columbus other than Goudreau there's not really anything else like it, you know it, and you go through all of the real bottom feeders like there's just not a ton of the right guy uh, available and uh, so I, I think that we might be waiting a bit um, like especially for like say a team like Florida like if they continue to be awful um, you might start to see them sell off certain pieces to re- recoup some assets. I think a big thing with this discussion as well is the Flames, I think, want to wait as long as they can to make that deal if for no other reason they cure cap space every day. Right now yeah. they're at $1.841 million in a cured cap space, which really isn't a lot to take on a contract without sending one out. We see the NHL All-Star Game this year on the 4th of February, pretty much one month before the March 3rd trade deadline. And 
Matt, I'll be honest, just because of all these reasons, like you said, there's a lot of tight races out there. I don't think there's a, a ton of teams that are out yet. The cap, I think a lot of these things, I don't see the Flames making that move before the February 4th All-Star game. No, neither do I. Uh, I think that like the earliest you'll see it is probably around the time we got to Foley last year. Um, just for logistics of teams not being out of it yet, uh you know, like, say, like, Vancouver is trying to shop Brock Besser. Well, they're still close enough where, like, their season's not over yet. And so they're not going to be wanting to throw in the towel necessarily right yet. Um, but, you know, like, if they're, you know, sliding to 10, 11, 12, 13 points away from the playoff spot you know, in a month from now, then it's like, yeah, there's no realistic way Vancouver's returning to, you know, be in the conversation. So at that point, you kind of, it makes sense to cut bait with some guys. And and I think even at that point, um, with a guy like Besser potentially on the board, if you're the Flames, you might also want to wait until that deal gets done because you might then have a team that needs to. They've acquired Besser. They need either shed a body or some cap space, and you might be able to take advantage of sort of the you know the dominoes falling. Yeah, exactly. And we didn't really have that name last year. Yeah, and there are plenty of you know different situations like Nashville and St. Louis, for example have both been, frankly, terrible for where I think their own expectations have been. Like, uh, especially St. Louis. Like, I th- I think that they were kind of expecting to be where Winnipeg is right now, uh, 10 points ahead of where they're at currently. And, you know, they have a lot of good, high-quality veterans where if they wanted to kick off a mini retool, they could easily do so. Um, and like build around Jordan Cairo moving forward. Um, so like there are plenty of options. It's just that there's just not enough information yet on, uh, the playoff pitcher yet for us to make any really. And I think the fact the flames are trending upwards, you can delay that decision a bit as well. I think this team probably really wants to look at what they've got, both at the NHL level, at the AHL level, and really figure out what assets they have, what assets they're willing to part with, and what they, you know, guys like Dubé, guys like, um, you know, Monjapani, what are they and what are they going to be this year? And I think those are the, the big questions that we still have to have answered. Yeah, and, like, I don't think that we've seen the last of Matthew Phillips either. I think that they will actually give him more of a shot in the, the next little while. Um, it, I think it... You know, like him practicing at the NHL level and him getting a couple of games in, uh, it, you know, it, it's sort of like when the Flames uh, sat Dubé last year and for three games, just, you know, learning at the NHL level, then going applying the things that we're pointing out in your game that are weaknesses in the AHL and then come back. And, I, you know, Phillips has been dominant since he's been back in the A. And I think that if he continues to play effectively and, um, you know, works on whatever the coaching staff has pointed out, that I think, like, in the next few weeks, you'll see him recalled once more and given an actual opportunity. Could definitely happen. Before before Christmas and our last show, you and I had maybe been a little bit hard on the coach and talked about potentially it's uh, time to move on. If the flames haven't turned things around at this point, I am fully behind Daryl Sutter. Once again, I think that we've seen enough change in the team in the last week that it's not time to can the coach. And I think we can keep Daryl till the end of the year. How are you feeling right now? Uh, same, but you know, the, How would you say the team still needs to figure out a way of getting more high danger scoring chances and, you know, perhaps reducing the emphasis on bad shots from bad areas. But I don't know Uh, how much that's the coach either. True. Uh, It's also one of those where I think that there needs to be more of a balance of um, situationally taking shots, uh, like if you you have no traffic in front of the net, 
or you know like the goalie can see you then perhaps not take the weak shot from the point um you know like things like that where you know uh, maybe look for a pass instead uh where like i think the flames last year had a little bit more patience and allowing the plays to develop. And those are all which, things you can clean up with this coaching staff. Those aren't things you yeah. need to change, oh, change no, the I head know. coach to clean up. Yeah, no, and uh, that's what I'm kind of illustrating is that, like, moving forward, that that's, the, like, the main thing that I think that this team needs to work on. Um, but, you know, we're seeing slow counter indications of, um, you know, towards the positive direction for this team uh based from where they were previously it's just okay you're part of the way now let's get the rest of the way and we're not there yet but you know they are winning a lot of games uh, that kind of that really just has to continue and playing more effectively in those games and you know one thing i think we can point to daryl as his positive influence is the fact that the Flames now have the most games decided by one goal this season. And that's something Daryl's talked about since he came back, since he became head coach again. You've got to be comfortable in those one-goal games. And I feel like the fact that how often in the past have we seen the team, you know, let's say the Vancouver game where they're up by three, Vancouver gets two, they just fall apart. I feel like this season especially this season and last season, but I would say, you know, being fresh in my mind this season, the Flames are doing a good job of managing those one-goal games, and I think that is very much a, a coaching thing. Well, and you're seeing a lot of times where, like, say like the Oilers game where they lost, um, they still outshot the Oilers 24-4 to in the third period. Uh, in the Kings game, they gave up two quick ones in the third, battled back and fought through, and managed to force overtime uh vancouver that after they drew within one they effectively shut them down and i think that they're getting more effective at uh like not uh making risky plays uh when they're up by one it, like generate the offense but don't be stupid about it and you know like yeah that it's lending them to getting a ton of shots but um, like you're seeing guys being in easily defensively responsible spots on the ice when the play dies for us on the attack, that all of the guys are able to get back and play effectively defensively. So that way, uh, the other team can't get like those odd man rushes or like the three on twos, that kind of thing. And you know, it's making Markstrom and Vladar's job a lot easier in those situations Agreed. because they're not having to face multiple bad situations. You know, and I think that's also a big reason why both of them have played a lot better of late, too. When you look at the first 38 games, the 2022 section of this season, who would you say is the best Flames player in the in 2022? Well, we won't say the whole year, but for you know this half of this season. I'm going to have to go uh, with a uh, tie uh, with one forward and one defenseman, and I'm going to have to go with Elias Lindholm and Rasmus Anderson. Interesting. Why those two? Uh, well, Lindholm has just quietly been effective and gone about his business, done everything that the Flames needed him to be. Uh, he's not as high of scoring as he was last year, but that entirely makes sense. But he is still providing the high-end two-way play that we needed him to. And Raz has taken off offensively this year, um, and uh, that's a huge thing for him and the team. Like He already has 27 points, which is extremely impressive. Uh, for being only 38 games into the season. Uh, he's on pace for a career year. Uh, he's already tied his career high in goals. And it's looking like he's taking the next step to being a number one defenseman. 
I'm going to go a bit of a different direction. I'm going to give mine... I, I'm going to have two players as well. I don't know if I'd tie them, but for different reasons. Uh, one is Tyler Toffoli. I think with Johnny and Matthew leaving this year, we knew that there was going to be a spot for someone to step up. And then Tyler Toffoli stepped in there well. I think he's been one of the most consistent flames this year, even though the goals didn't come. He, very much like you were describing from Manjapani earlier, I think he's been doing all the right things. And I think that... Uh, Tyler DeFoley has looked like one of the best forwards for me. And the other guy I'm going to go with is Dan Vladar. We know that we've had some challenges with um, our starting goaltender this year. And I think that if Vladar didn't step up, the Flames would be in a lot worse spot. I'm not saying that he's you know going to win our, our most valuable player at the end of the year. But I feel like the Flames would not be where they were if not for the uh, the good play we've seen from our backup. Oh, for sure. And he's been a revelation this year as well, uh, taking the next step towards himself of being an NHL starting goaltender. Uh, I was having a chat with a guy on Twitter about that. How much do you think the Flames safe signing him before the season as opposed to after the season? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, Toffoli has been excellent as well and uh, very much more the player that I think the fans were expecting him to and, be. And management expect him to be. Yeah, you know, and yeah, you know, he he kind of he too goes about his business and is just a generally reliable top six scorer. And you know he's doing his thing, putting up about the production that you'd expect from him. He's on pace for thirty goals and sixty points. That's about what you would expect from him. And you know hey, he's doing great. And. Uh, you know, like it, neither of those players are um, hurting their reputations for being quality players. Well, before we uh, before we do our predictions here, let's talk about the Wranglers quickly. The Wranglers, uh, I've very impressive. They have finished twenty twenty two with the best record in the entire AHL with a twenty one seven and one record, which is. They they use win percentage as their stat in the AHL as opposed to total points like we do, but they're at a .741 win percentage, which is a really good stat. And we saw last year the Wranglers, they were Stockton last year, were an amazing team. They got off to a bit of a slow start this year, but this team has been on fire. This is a great hockey team to watch. Yeah, like they were 2-5 and five to start the year, and like they're they've been 19-2-1 since then. And yeah. like they're just absolutely destroying everybody down there. Yeah, Forty three points. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it as much as it's uh, good offense from some of the young guys like uh, Pedersen, Phillips, Peltier, um, you know, and a whole bunch of other guys. Uh, it's also been a good overall team defense and. Uh, Wolf is looking every much as good of a prospect as we've seen. So, you know, a lot to look forward to in the coming months and seasons from the guys that are down there. And hopefully some of them start translating their game up into the NHL level sooner than later. And I'd say for everyone listening, if you haven't gone to see a Wranglers game yet, make that your 2023 resolution. Go watch this team. They're, yeah, it's, it's a, a lot very- of fun. And it's a very different level of hockey. I've talked to some people who said, well, I've seen the Hitmen play. This is not the Calgary Hitmen. This is professional hockey. These, this is a good team. It's a fun game to go to. It's much more affordable than the Flames. But I would challenge everybody who's listening to make sure that they're seeing a Wranglers game live this year if you're in Calgary. Yeah, like at this point, like I, I think that the Wranglers could beat a number of teams in the NHL. And uh, more Wranglers news as they look forward to their All-Star game in in February, which I believe it's in Laval this year. Uh, The Wranglers head coach, Mitch Love, will be coaching the Pacific Division team. So they don't have all the players announced, but he is going to be coaching in that game. Matt, he's only one of three guys now who's been in the AHL All-Star game as both a coach and a player. The other two, um, Peter LaViolette. And John Stevens, which kind of surprises me. Those are the other two. Yeah, I never really thought of Laviolette as like an a professional athlete. I always thought of him as more like uh, you know, insert miscellaneous uh, coach that like uh, Ken Hitchcock, who uh, 
is just more of a knowledgeable person about hockey, not. Well, you know, an and when player. I when I heard that too, I thought just in my head, I thought there's been how many Sutters that have played and coached. Like one of them must have done it. Like there's been you know other guys that we know have been guys like um, you know Colorado's coach who you know had a decent NHL career. Like I don't know, you you'd think that there's more guys that have done that. Mm-hmm. So interesting stat there to have Mitch Love in the uh, in the record books, but. Watch out for the Wranglers. Go watch them if you can, whether on uh, HL TV online or if you can get to the Dome. It's affordable fun, and it's a lot of fun to watch. But, well, Matt, let's look ahead to the January schedule here. You always like to do this. The Flames have um, a long road trip. They have a four-game, five-game road trip here. They've got a three-game homestand. What are you seeing for the Flames' January schedule? Well, frankly, the quality of opponents this month upcoming is... A lot less so than like what we've been facing like they have a couple of good opponents uh they play winnipeg they play dallas uh colorado for a game tampa for a game you know and all of those teams even if they're not high in the standings they all four of those teams are you know like dallas and winnipeg are high in the standings but the other ones are kind of like right on the borderline of their playoff spots but like all the other teams, like the Islanders are bad, the Blackhawks are bad, Seattle's falling back to earth, um, Columbus is terrible, Nashville is unexpectedly terrible. St. Louis has terrible. some key injuries right now. Yeah, and it's one of those where like Calgary, frankly, should be running over most of these teams. Um, and like the four games against the good ones, if they get a split in that, that that would be ideal and you know then carrying on by beating up everybody else so yeah i mean the flames start the the month against winnipeg on the road then the islanders at home then they go on a road trip at chicago at st louis at st louis at dallas at nashville then they come home for colorado tampa bay columbus chicago and then on the road against seattle if i'm looking at the games i'm really excited about this month One of them is going to be the 18th against the Colorado Avalanche. I think even though the Avalanche aren't doing well this year, they're still a meter stick to judge this team against, being the defending Stanley Cup champions. We've had success against them already, and I think that one's going to be interesting. I think the 21st, again, will be interesting against Tampa Bay, which is a 1 p.m. start. And normally I wouldn't care about the Blue Jackets coming to town, but... I'm really curious to see what the Flames fans' reaction to Johnny Goudreau and the Blue Jackets is going to be. Yeah, I would be mildly shocked if he did not have a chorus of boos following him around every time he's on the ice. Um, You know, even more so and more intently when he has the puck. Um, He really did kind of make himself public enemy number one with his commentaries subsequent to signing with Columbus. And, you know, frankly, yeah. Um, and it makes me wonder if any old teammates like Lucic or guys like that who might feel, you know, maybe didn't handle things right might uh, get involved. Let's put yeah, that and, and, you know, there's always going to be some chippiness. I, I think that, um, like, the team kind of just needs to move on and you know i think it'll be a cathartic i think they need to move on but i also think it's going to be kind of therapeutic to have them come back and get that out of everybody's system yeah and that's what i was going to say is it'll be a cathartic experience to boo the ever loving heck out of him uh for the game and with him being in the east we thankfully don't play him very often so once at home and once on the road yeah, and I think that will continue moving forward as well, even though they're trying to reformat the schedule a bit. But, you well, know, if you, if you I, look I at what was said, they want to reform the schedule to give you more rival plays. So that's not going to be Columbus. Yeah. And it's one of those where, you know, uh, frankly, like as a, you know, Flames fan, seeing Columbus near the bottom of the standings makes me happy. I'm not going to lie. Like, you know, it's like, thanks. But, yep. you know, good decision. And you then know. we should should note here as well that starting January 28th, the Flames have their bye week. That's something we haven't seen in a little bit. And they'll get a nine game or sorry, a nine day break from games at that point. Yeah. Which coincides with the all-star game as well. So 
It, yeah, yeah, it just works out that way. And even yeah, like it's, it, it's always what you some teams have it before and some teams have it after the All Star break. Still, right? Yeah. Well, like if you just uh, look slightly ahead into like the early part of February schedule, like the first eight games, you got two against the Rangers, two against the Red Wings, Ottawa, Philadelphia, Arizona, and Buffalo. Buffalo. Like all eight of those teams are bad, yeah. and you know, like. That's where, like, the Flames, like, if they can get their stuff in order, like, they can go on a very long and lengthy, not necessarily winning streak, but, like, winning two out of three, three out of yeah. four type of Yeah, this is the time to make up some points. Yeah, like, uh, would I be shocked if, say, we're talking after the February 22nd game and the Flames are first in the division? No. Well, they play Vegas on the 23rd. I could see them playing Vegas for first in the division at that point. Yeah. And, like, even after that point, like, most of the schedule beyond, like, there's a few good games in immediately after, like, February 23rd. There's a bunch of good games right after that. But then after that, like, six-game segment, it once again is back to, like, really mediocre teams for the rest of the schedule. So, like, the Flames really do have a really, really light and easy schedule the rest of the season. So, it, it will be a stark contrast from what we've been seeing thus far. Which I think there's pros and cons to having your hard part at the beginning. I think it's, you know, it's nice you can make up some points and whatnot, but I think it, there's also some merit to fighting as you go into the playoffs. Well, how would you say, like, you you look at, like, uh, when uh, St. Louis won the Cup a couple years ago, like, they were just motoring over everybody they were. Heading, in, he- heading into the playoffs. And I think that, like, if the Flames, say, like, over the next handful of months get into that, like, prolonged, we're just, like, winning almost every game, you know, and are virtually unbeatable, and you, like, go acquire that second line st- winger and 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 like doing all the proper things like this team could be like red hot to use a (laughs) you know lame cliche don't don't make me play the 80s song you know but they could be coming into the playoffs red hot and like you know on a very long winning streak heading on into the postseason and you know if the flames are that kind of hot heading in you know, like you could logically see this team going on a lengthy winning period during the postseason, whether they that means, you know, winning a round or two or more yet to be seen. But, you know, like it, the, the, the things are in place for them to be set up for success. Now it's time to dance. Well, they have three dances this week, three games to play, all odd, odd start times. They will play Tuesday the 3rd in Winnipeg at 6 p.m. start time. Then Friday the 6th back here in Calgary against the Islanders at 7 p.m. start time. And then Sunday the 8th against Chicago at 5 p.m. start time. Matt, what are your predictions for these ones? Uh, overtime loss to Winnipeg and then winning the last two. Okay, so loss to Winnipeg... We'll call that a loss in our system. Oh, yeah. Um, and then a win, because we're either doing one or zero points. So you think they'll beat the Islanders and they'll beat Chicago? Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm going to go a little bit differently. I'm going to say they win all three. Yeah. That's where I was leaning, but, you know, uh, it's one of those that Hellebuck has been really good for Winnipeg this year. He has. Um, Like, that game against the Oilers on New Year's Eve was awesome. (laughs) You know, like, Winnipeg was not having a good game, and yet, (laughs) you know. And that's that's my only hesitation. Like, they they better beat Chicago. Yeah, like, things have gone very wrong if they do not beat Chicago. Yeah, they better beat Chicago. They can beat the Islanders, though. The Islanders, I think, have enough punch to beat the Flames if they don't play a good game. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then, yeah, that Winnipeg game, it's a toss-up for me. Like, I think it could go either way, but I'm going to give the Flames the win in that one. Hellebuck's look good, but Hellebuck hasn't looked superhuman. Yeah. He's been beaten. And I feel like the Flames are starting to get their game together 
where I think this might be the game to get them going by beating Hellebuck. Yeah, like uh, Winnipeg as a team, um, like their offense has, like they've literally scored one more goal than the Flames have this year. Um, they've also given up 20 fewer. Um, and th- that literally is the four point dis- difference mm-hmm. in the standings is that Hellebuck has just been awesome. Uh, but I don't really see them as being all that and then some. Uh, no. They're just there. And. You know, uh, if they can solve the goaltending, uh, they should be able to skate away with two points. But that literally, it just depends on can they beat Hellebuck. And, yeah. Where do you play Dan Vladar, if at all? Uh, Probably the Chicago game. Yeah, I agree. Just because, like, really, that's a gimme two points. Like, they should be able to beat them. I agree. Without. And and Vladar, I mean, is no longer just your gimme two point goalie. But yeah, I think that's the right one. Yeah. Well, plus uh, with uh, the road trip upcoming, um, like they're especially like towards the uh, middle and back uh, trip, it, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, so uh, I would expect, you know, like him maybe to get one of the St. Louis games as well. And I think if you not- want to give St. Louis a different look in each game. Yeah. And like, I would expect the Dallas game to be, uh, Markstrom and the Nashville game probably to be Vladar again. So yeah, I can see that. cause then you have two tough games with Colorado and Tampa. You throw those both Markstrom's and you know, then you have like three easy games after that. So you can switch it up. Is David Riddick still a backup in Winnipeg? Yep. I was just thinking about Winnipeg. I, we were talking about Winnipeg and Nashville. I'm like, he was in Nashville? Yeah, no, I think he's in Winnipeg. So, yeah, I'm checking here on NHL.com, and he is. Yeah, so. he gave up 801 to um, Ovechkin. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I did see that clip. Yeah. Well, Matt, that's it for this week. As we move into 2023 next week, we will go through, as we hit the official midway point of the season, our preseason predictions and see how we're doing. And... uh if we, how well we've been able to look into our crystal ball and see what's happened in the first half. Yeah. And probably not as good, but that also makes sense due to all of the factors. So, you know, we, sh- we shall the, find the out. second half is the important part and the part that matters. So we'll see as always go flames. Go fireside chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.